Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be invited to speak at this historic event. Um, higher education is today is obviously in a, a deep crisis, and nothing could be more important than reforming the universities, um, but also in founding new ones that can recapture the ideals of the universities, the great universities of the past, and that will serve as models for those of the future. Um, originally, I was asked to speak here about um, uh, academic freedom, but discussing academic freedom uh, really involves discussing the larger purpose of the university. Uh, it involves what Cardinal John Henry Newman called uh, the idea of a university. Um, does any such idea really exist? Um, considerable evidence indicates that uh, the origins and development of universities was uh, involved improvisation and that no master plan guided the operation. And yet something distinguishable, identifiable, does distinguish universities from other kinds of education. We seldom hear about the need for academic freedom in secondary schools. Secondary education uh, involves mostly transmitting a body of knowledge that has been agreed as appropriate by who, whatever authority operates the school, the church, the state, the parents. Uh, uh, and if instructors engage in scholarship, it's usually on their own time and not part of their regular duties. But higher education involves not only the transmission of knowledge, but also its production, it, scholarship as well as, as teaching. Higher education is based on the principle that the most advanced students should learn from those uh, who not only acquire knowledge, but also contribute to it. Most professors are not trained in teaching or pedagogy. Um, they're lecturers who impart knowledge to adults uh, with the nuance characteristic of how they acquired it. Scholarship and teaching are expected to complement one another, not conflict. The fact that this ideal has largely been lost in most universities uh, involves trends, but there are trends that can be challenged, and that's something, in fact, we might want to talk about. So academic freedom is a value without which higher education itself is impossible, because without its scholarship, will lack integrity. But academic freedom is a tricky concept. It cannot become a license to allow scholarship and instruction to degenerate into uh, mere opinions and inflict those opinions on a captive audience of students or a, a readership uh, uh, with the university's imprimatur. Um, Doubtless opinions do enter into scholarship, but scholarship involves elevating the topic being researched above mere opinions by providing a larger context, facts and documentation for one thing, or um, as well as uh, history, philosophy, science, religion, art, the larger body of human knowledge. Otherwise, there's no lasting contribution to knowledge and no institutional benefit. Above all, academic freedom cannot be a license to introduce political ideologies into scholarship. This means recasting all human knowledge as political grievances. This is precisely what has led to the deterioration of higher education. And not only must we not repeat or continue that mistake, we must find ways to reverse it, which is precisely what we are trying to do with the Collegium Intermarium. Recently, we had a stark example of this right here in Central Europe. Ironically, it involved uh, another quite different university that was also recently founded uh, with the avowed purpose of restoring the integrity of higher education. They, uh, they introduced programs that were openly ideological and expected the taxpayers of Hungary to pay for it. Um, something had ha similar had happened in the Czech Republic and right here in Poland uh, only a few years earlier. When the taxpayers of Hungary refused, uh, the university objected, uh, and they specifically objected to the, to the subject matter. Uh, the university claimed that its academic freedom was being violated. Yet this was a perfectly legitimate uh, response by the Hungarian government and people. The episode was doubly ironic because the ideology they introduced has itself been documented to be responsible for intimidating instructors and students who hesitate to accept its academic legitimacy because of its ideological character. In other words, they were, those who were aiming to curtail the academic freedom of others 
were invoking and distorting the very principle that they were violating. Paraphrasing Antoine de Saint-Just during the French Revolution, they might have proclaimed no academic freedom for the enemies of academic freedom. So, so while academic freedom has been abused in recent years by ideologues who politicize the curriculum and purge those who do not accept their ideology, in other words, the, the cancel culture as we call it, those who are purged or canceled can still invoke the principle to defend themselves. It is no reason to abandon the principle itself. We must, but we have to discern carefully how it is being invoked and for what purposes in order to decide if it is legitimate and worthy of being defended. Various schemes have been devised in recent decades to guarantee protection for academic freedom. None of them has been very successful. The tenure system succeeded only in creating different castes of scholars. First, there are those who are uh, privileged and protected to the point that they can enjoy the fruits of their scholarship, of their employment, without having to, 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 to produce any scholarship at all. Um, and then there are those, uh, the growing body of adjunct who, adjuncts who uh, are often have no protection at all and can be victimized at will. As an alternative, some have proposed that government authorities uh, sh who fund universities should use the leverage that they enjoy in order to legislate statutory protections for academic freedom. But it is, it's difficult for me to see how this could work. First, it involves state authorities in determining what views are acceptable and worthy of protection. They would get into, we would get into the question of how to judge the value of scholarship and who judges it, how far various ideas should be protected and so forth. This seems to me a prescription for endless quarrels and continued politicization. Increasingly, I am convinced that only one effective method exists for protecting and ensuring academic freedom, and that is publicity. Universities that punish lecturers or students for their research or views need to have their actions publicly known so the public and interested parties can assess for themselves if the measures are justified. Like any freedom, after all, academic freedom is not absolute. For one thing, creedal institutions, faith-based faith universities, uh, have a legitimate right to insist that their lecturers adhere to certain core doctrines of their faith as a condition for employment and for the privilege of publishing their scholarship uh, under the institution's name. <clears throat> and students as well, of course, have this. Um, but in any institution, if we find professors are really espousing doctrines that are beyond the pale of decency, Nazism, for example, or Stalinism, uh, we might well decide that they should be disciplined or removed. But it must always be done openly, with reasons clearly stated, not furtively and not by stealth. The public and interested parties, oversight bodies, students, professors, parents, donors, alumni, all of these have a right to know why a professor or a student is reprimanded or dismissed so they can judge for themselves if the institution has acted properly. An added benefit, by the way, of all this might be that academic scholarship may become less cloistered and wider groups may take an interest in it, demand that it be made accessible, and develop the critical faculties necessary to understand and evaluate it. Traditionally, such responsibility rests, rests with oversight bodies such as boards of trustees and faculty senates. But one of the great lessons of today's crisis is that these bodies have become unreliable. According to John Ellis, the author of The Breakdown of Higher Education, boards, quote, boards of trustees, college presidents, faculty senates, they all looked on and did nothing as the universities deteriorated. They were all either too cowardly or too complicit to act, end quote. Yet these bodies still have a critical role to play in ensuring quality education, and nothing is stopping them from resuming that role. But in a democratic society, the rest of us also have a responsibility to know what is being researched and taught in our universities. We can't complain about the condition or the trends of the universities if we avert our eyes from them until it is too late. The corollary, too, is that those of us who work in the universities must hold constant discussions about the condition of our own institutions to ensure that we are respecting the principle and potential problems are addressed before they get out of control. An institution that will not discuss academic freedom 
is one that, is, that threatens it. And once it becomes threatened, it is more difficult to protect. For then open discussion is difficult, a fear factor arises, and those who would otherwise protect their colleagues themselves begin to feel intimidated and paralyzed. Controversy, after all, is not harmful for a university. It can be very beneficial. It demonstrates health, intellectual health, and intellectual courage. What is fatal is when scholars or universities are unable or unwilling to defend themselves in the marketplace of ideas and instead hide behind secrecy. This is the death of institutions as we have seen repeatedly in the Western world. The striking feature about today's loss of freedom in the academy is that it does not come from outside. It does not come from tyrannical government. It does not come from moneyed interests. It does not come from dogmatic religion. The foremost threat to the freedom in the academy comes from within, from the academy's own privilege and arrogance and cowardice. That is why reforming existing institutions is not enough and why we need new institutions like the Collegium Intermarium. Thank you very much.